It appears Adeses, the Crown Prince of the Allens, has made a fatal mistake. He has proven himself to be an exceptional commander, but his confidence borders on recklessness, and his army has been reduced from a thousand men to a little over 600 in a matter of months. As the winter snow sets in, he finds himself trapped deep in enemy territory, his force too weak to survive the long journey back home. Adeses has never been more vulnerable, and his enemies know it. Gnaeus Piso, the governor of Septimania, marches a fresh army through the snow to bring the Allens to battle. Piso's force numbers almost 3,000, and includes infantry, cavalry, skirmishers, and artillery. He attacks from three sides surrounding the city. It appears Adeses has made a fatal mistake, but in 12 minutes' time, the Allens will still number 500. The Septimanian survivors will number just two. The Allens campaign, when played conventionally, is a fun and somewhat unique experience. Your entire unit roster is built around attacking, to the point that you don't have any foot archers and your only spearmen are the dog handlers in your warhound units. The Allens also have an obvious bias towards cavalry, which can be pretty fun to lean into. But as you add more and more horsemen to your army, something weird happens. At a certain point it goes from a gimmick to an effective strategy, and when you only use cavalry, the Allens campaign becomes one of the wildest and most entertaining campaigns you'll ever play. So what makes this strategy so special? In my opinion, there's two reasons. The first is that it's broken as hell. You can take on armies several times your size and win. You can take on armies made entirely of units that counter you and win. And you can take on armies several times your size composed entirely of units that counter you and still somehow win. Armies like that are fun to command, at least for a time. What makes the Allens really special is the second reason. You still have to actually earn these victories. Unlike, say, an army of dinosaurs in Warhammer 2, this army is only powerful if you can run it properly. If you just select all your units and charge the enemy, you'll lose. The only way to win with this kind of force is to take control of the battlefield and destroy the enemy army unit by unit, and you can't do that without feeling like a tactical genius and having a good time. Infantry is the core of almost every army, so if you've ever played a total war game before, you probably have at least some idea of how they work and how to command them effectively. Cavalry is basically the same, but with one obvious difference. They're all on horseback. This has several effects on their stats. The first effect is that they have a much higher speed and charge bonus. The speed makes them move faster, and the charge bonus gives them some temporary bonuses when they charge someone. The second effect is one of balance. If a cavalry unit and an infantry unit cost the same, and the cavalry unit is much better in those two stats, then it follows that they have to be worse at something else in order to keep them somewhat balanced. Exactly what this is will vary from unit to unit, but since speed has absolutely no effect on melee combat effectiveness, and every single other stat in the game does, then it follows that cavalry must always lose some combat effectiveness in the trade-off, and therefore they will almost always lose in a fair fight to infantry of the same price. So why use cavalry then? The answer is that high speed. While cavalry loses in a fair fight, the high speed means that we don't actually have to fight fair. Consider two battles. In one, it's a single cavalry unit versus an infantry unit of the same price. The infantry wins every time. In the other, it's the same units, but now there's three on each side. In theory, the infantry should still win, but in practice, we can use our superior speed to turn it into three one-sided battles where we outnumber the enemy. There are two key lessons to learn here. The first is that under the right conditions, cavalry can outperform units that should be far better than them. But the second lesson is that that can only happen if you, the commander, put in a whole lot of extra work, far more work than you'd have to do with other units. What this means is that regardless of how powerful our armies are in theory, they're going to be useless in practice if we can't properly manage them, which means we need to find as many ways as we can to make this army simpler and easier to use. Speaking of which, let's design an army. If we're already significantly limiting our unit options by only recruiting cavalry, then we'd naturally assume that we want as many different kinds of cavalry as possible in our armies. Now, having that unit diversity is useful because it adds different strengths to your army and opens up many new potential strategies, but actually exploiting these possibilities is extra work on your part. Imagine you want to fight a pretty standard enemy army with multiple different unit types in it. In theory, the most effective counter to that army that we can make would be to bring a mix of units that are all specialized in taking down each of the enemy's unit types, and then making sure that we correctly pair the right units up on the battlefield. But the specialized nature of our army means that if the wrong units fight each other, then we could suffer a crushing defeat. If instead we just recruit an army of units that are pretty good in most situations, then as long as we have the more expensive army, we can be pretty confident that we're going to win. 
The diverse force has greater room to succeed, but also to fail. So if the core premise of our army already makes it really complicated and hard to run, then it follows that maybe we should keep it pretty simple in terms of the troops we select. For this reason, I'm going to advocate for literally just recruiting the one unit type. You can mix it up with a bunch of different units, and in theory that can lead to even more ridiculous battle results, but you shouldn't try doing it until you've properly mastered the single unit army first. The unit we recruit has to fit several important criteria. They've got to be cheap. Cavalry are already expensive and we don't want a full-size army to destroy our economy. They have to be recruitable from the start of the Allens campaign, and we still need to be able to recruit them once we've settled somewhere. And they have to be melee cavalry. Ranged cavalry are way too complex to even think about, and shot cavalry have a lot less room for error, since they're basically useless if they fail to charge or if they stay in combat for more than 20 seconds. This leaves us with only one option, but the good news is that it's actually a really good one. Alani Cavalry Warriors are one of the cheapest mounted units in the game. We can recruit them right from the start, and once we settle, we can recruit them from literally anywhere that we have a farm. They're solid melee fighters, and as extra icing on the cake, they have guerrilla deployment, resistance to fatigue, campaign stealth, raider, and even fire while moving for some reason. So, let's build our army. To start with, I'll do an early game build when you're still a horde and trying to save some cash, so I'll just have a general and nine units. That's it. Nice and easy. Now, to demonstrate how this army works, let's give ourselves an opponent for a practice battle. We'll make them the Alamans, but we'll give them an army that any of the dramatic tribes could field. The sort of thing that you could run into while invading Roman lands before 400 AD. Since this is a demonstration, I'll give them a few different unit types, a core of spears, a unit of pikes, several archers, some cavalry, and an artillery piece. This army is a little bit more expensive than mine, but the balance of power suggests they're evenly matched, AI difficulty is very hard, and we'll fight them in a flat desert so everything's easy to see and no side has a particular advantage. By the way, if you want, you can set up this battle yourself as a bit of a training exercise, see if you can beat my results. Now, before I start the battle, we still have a little bit more theory to cover. There's no point in just charging the enemy without knowing what units we should be engaging and in what order. So here's a very general overview of what to expect from each enemy unit. Ranged units are complete trash in melee combat. A single unit of cavalry will completely destroy a ranged unit very quickly and with minimal losses. But that doesn't mean they're not a threat. If they're able to shoot at you, ranged units can inflict pretty serious damage, especially if they attack from an angle where your unit's shields aren't effective. This means we want to eliminate them pretty early into the fight. Artillery are basically an extreme version of archers, being even easier to kill but also having a much longer range and more powerful missile attack. Like archers, these are a high priority unit to engage. Cavalry comes in a few flavors with different levels of risk. Shot cavalry will typically lose to melee cavalry due to having worse combat stats, but they can do a lot of damage if they successfully charge you. As for melee cavalry, as a general rule, sword and axe cavalry lose to spear cavalry who get a bonus attacking mounted units. Because your troops are all spear cavalry, they'll go pretty well against most enemy horsemen, but since the AI tends to be pretty aggressive with their cavalry, there's really no reason not to just isolate and overwhelm them with several units at once. Bow cavalry are another matter entirely. Either they're slower than you, in which case you kill them easily, or they're faster, in which case there's not really anything you can do about them. Trapping them typically isn't worth it, it's really hard to do and it takes several units and a lot of your effort to make happen. Instead, consider setting aside one of your own units to just chase after it for the whole battle. Alani cavalry warriors have a decent missile block chance, so it won't take too much damage, and eventually the enemy will run out of ammo and die. Another important detail about cavalry as a whole is they're the only unit that can match your speed, which makes them a high priority target. Even a light cavalry unit with poor combat stats can still wildly derail our plans by hitting us in the rear at a critical moment, or holding one of our units in place just long enough for their infantry to catch us. Because of this, we want to eliminate the enemy's cavalry as soon as possible. You may notice at this point that I've said we want to kill their archers, cavalry, and artillery at the start of the battle, which seems like a lot. But with this army, it's entirely realistic to kill every one of those units within the first two minutes, and that's what we're going to do. Infantry are the biggest problem. As with cavalry, the ones with the spears are a bigger threat than the ones with swords or axes, but almost all of them can take a unit of cavalry head-on and win. To kill a unit of infantry, you need at least two, preferably three units, attacking them from different sides. The facing is important. A unit of spearmen can hold off three units of cavalry head-on without issues. You need to be surrounding it to really do damage. What this means is that engaging infantry requires a lot of space on the battlefield and your undivided attention, which means it should be one of the last things we do. Pikemen are like spearmen on steroids. They're absolutely unkillable from the front when they're in formation, but they'll die much easier than most other infantry when attacked from any other side. One cavalry unit will typically be enough to take care of them if you do it right. So, here's the plan. We take advantage of guerrilla deployment to start as close to the enemy as possible. This means less time getting shot by artillery, and we avoid gaining unnecessary fatigue. My personal strategy is to deploy in three evenly sized forces. One on the left, one on the right, and one in the center. No matter what you do, don't make these groups into actual groups with hotkeys. This is going to be a very fluid formation, making them into groups like that is going to become a problem when half of the right flank starts fighting on the left or whatever else happens. We want to eliminate the enemy cavalry and archers first, so we'll start by attacking with both flanks and leaving the center as a reserve. We attack each unit until it breaks, then retreat and strike somewhere else immediately afterwards. Once it's just infantry left, we surround and destroy each unit one by one until they're all gone. Remember that we deliberately designed this as a beginner-friendly army. There's a lot to keep track of, but it's okay if you forget about a unit and it gets engaged by infantry, or their archers are able to shoot at us a bit, or whatever, because our units are pretty resilient and they'll survive it. So let's begin! 
So, the first thing I'm doing is probing forward aggressively with the flanks. The enemy responds by deploying its cavalry, so that's our first target. On the right, I carefully manage my troops to try and surround the enemy so I can kill them more efficiently, but because my attention is over there, the left flank gets a bit more chaotic. This is normal, this is fine, this is why we picked melee cavalry, because we don't always need to be micromanaging them to make them useful. The center doesn't have a lot going on, so I commit some of it to each flank, but by now you may have noticed that a very nasty gap has appeared in the enemy line, so in go the horses. Pro tip, if a unit looks like it might get engaged, giving it another move order can often get it unstuck. At this point, the flanks are largely won, so the next step is to retreat away before the enemy infantry catches up. Since we just drove their archers deep into the back line, the obvious move is to circle around there and finish them off. Enemy units have rallied and returned to the battle! The general is sort of exposed, but I decide to hold off while those spears are still next to him. At this point, the archers are getting absolutely brutalized, but we want to make sure we keep attacking them until they're completely shattered. Don't worry about dealing any damage beyond that point, though, we can catch back up to them later. The enemy infantry is trying to catch up, but in the process it's completely lost cohesion. If I had more troops at my disposal, I'd already be attacking their infantry, starting with the most isolated units. I don't have the manpower currently, but a useful strategy if you outnumber the enemy is to start committing troops to the cleanup operation early. Every time you route an enemy unit, leave one of your own behind to keep attacking them, if you can afford to. It'll help rack up the kills and shatter the enemy army on the campaign side of things. It's now almost time to attack the spearmen, but first I need to get my own forces back in order. While I want my own troops to get back in formation, I don't want the enemy to be able to do the same, so I split into two groups to encourage the enemy to separate. In case you're wondering, there's no grand plan or formations going on here. I had a planned way to start the engagement, but everything beyond that point is improvised based on the enemy's weaknesses and my own experience with what works. The enemy general's exposed enough now, so we're just going to go for it. Even though I outnumber him by a significant margin, it's still important to attack from multiple angles to reduce friendly casualties. You might have noticed that Spearman unit behaving unusually. I think at this point the AI has decided it's too spread out and that it needs to get as many units as possible back into formation, even if that means abandoning the general. Alternatively, my army moved so fast that it broke the AI a bit, which is something that occasionally happens with this strategy. Also, up until this point, I completely forgot that my own general existed, which just goes to show you that this strategy really doesn't require you to be fully on top of everything on the battlefield. There's no clean and easy way to deal with this formation, so I'm just going to find the most isolated unit, in this case the one on the far end, and hit it with 5 units of horsemen at once. The rest of the troops now circle around to the other end of the formation and wait for new vulnerabilities to open. Now that there's no cavalry or archers left, we really don't have to worry about our spacing at all, since we can outrun the enemy if they try to engage us. Note that leaving their infantry until last isn't just about having the space to operate. By killing everything else first, we also put the infantry's morale as low as possible before we engage them, which means the fight will be quicker and less bloody for our own troops. You may notice, for example, that some of these spearmen are breaking from incredibly minor losses. Our general is under attack!
away from victory. We won the battle, but now's the bit where we win the war. A good cleanup is essential, both because it absolutely destroys the enemy army on campaign, and because it results in far more impressive battle results. For each enemy unit, you want at least one of your own chasing them. If there's too many and you have to choose, start with the most distant enemies that you can still catch up to and then work your way inwards. So that's how you win a field battle. Unfortunately, that's not what most of your battles are going to be like. At least in my experience, I find the most common battles tend to be town and city assaults. Your army is, of course, based entirely around outmaneuvering the enemy, so fighting in city streets can present some issues. But it is a solvable problem. The most obvious solution is to conduct as much of the fighting as possible outside of the settlement, which if you're the defender just means charging out to meet the enemy, and if you're the attacker means trying to tempt as many units as possible out into the open. But no matter how skilled you are, you'll still have to do at least some fighting within the settlement. This part of the battle is won by focusing on strategy rather than tactics, as demonstrated through the sole battle replay I found. As I attack the settlement, the enemy formation moves and vulnerabilities open up. This fight here that I commit to is tactically stupid. I attack infantry head-on in a choke point, putting my cavalry at a significant disadvantage. But strategically it's fantastic, because now these units are free to flank the enemy without having to worry about being outflanked themselves. And once the enemy reserve is committed, my own reserve is free to act, and now I'm winning that fight. Note also this combat up here. This was originally intended to be a breakthrough, but the enemy committed more troops to the fight before I could break through their lines. Rather than retreat, which would have been the tactically sound decision, I stayed there because doing so meant that the bulk of their forces remained out of the critical part of the battle. It was only by giving my opponents tactical advantages that I was able to outmaneuver them strategically and win the battle. Walled settlements obviously present a lot more of a problem, as there's not an easy entry point to rush into. Because of this, I'm going to suggest a slight change to our army composition. Add a single unit of Onigas. Now, this isn't a cavalry unit, but in my opinion adding it to your army is more in keeping with the spirit of an old cavalry force than if you don't include it. If you don't have one, you have two options. Either you have to besiege the enemy settlement for several years until it surrenders, which goes against our whole fast-moving conquerors aesthetic that we've got going on, or you have to build siege equipment and then dismount our proud horsemen to push a battering ram. Of course, once you ram open the gates, then you have another problem because now the only way into the enemy settlement is a heavily defended choke point that will be near impossible to break through. On the other hand, if you have the Onager, now things are a lot more exciting. Target a section of wall away from the bulk of the enemy army, damage it really badly, and then just as it's about to fall, charge all your units at it at full speed. The second the wall collapses, you want your entire army inside that settlement as quickly as possible. One or two units charge the enemy to keep them from plugging the breach, and the rest of the army fans out and causes as much chaos as possible. If you outnumber the enemy, now is when you kill them. If you don't, then rush the capture point and spend the next 200 seconds holding off the enemy, and then congrats, you've stolen their settlement. That's more like how a horsemaster fights. If you do decide to add the Onager to your armies, then it actually has very little impact outside of sieges. There's no point trying to use it in the field, since it's probably going to do a lot of friendly fire once we start attacking, so just find a safe place for it far in the back line and hide it there. The last thing you need to know before kicking off an Allens campaign of your own is, well, what to do on the campaign side. Because the Allens are a horde, there's a lot of different ways to play them, but here's what I'd recommend if it's your first time. First, if you want to mess around with changing your religion, pause now for some advice. Now, take your western horde and march them towards Spain, avoiding eastern Roman lands on the way, and either disband your second army or use them to pick up a new religion if you're changing it. Once you reach Spain, recruit a bunch of cavalry and choose a settlement to conquer to start your empire. This is the hardest part of the game. Public order will be terrible, and your settlements won't have any real garrisons until you convert them to your culture, which will take about 10 turns and a huge amount of cash. Expect to play a lot of whack-a-mole as your army zooms around chasing down rebellions as they pop up. Just like on the battlefield, my advice is to be aggressive. Secure your first province as quickly as you can, then clean up and consolidate afterwards. It's better to have absolute chaos and a few rebellions, and then emerge on the other side a few turns later with a stable and productive province, than it is to make absolutely sure that nothing goes wrong, take twice as long to expand, and then find out all the other provinces you're about to expand into have been taken by rival empires. You're a horse lord. Go fast. Also, if you chose some religion from a faraway land with no presence in your new home, then get priests or priestesses as soon as you can. They are very, very useful for managing public order. Lastly, for the tech tree, note that barbarian factions are militarized societies, which means that most of their buildings have some form of military function. Because of this, a lot of your more powerful unit unlocks are actually located on the civic branch of the tech tree, which means you don't actually need to bother researching any military tech for a long time, with the exception of the tech that unlocks Onigas. Note also that this technology replaces your Alani cavalry warriors with Alani horsemen, which despite being more expensive are arguably worse troops for our strategy, so don't pick this up until you really need to. Alright, I keep saying this army is effective, but I haven't really showed off anything too crazy yet. So let's wreck some shit. Alan's army, early game, basic general and 19 Alani cavalry warriors, no levels of veterancy. This is an army you can put together in campaign within the first 10 turns. Total cost, 8,050. My opponent, Western Roman Empire, mid to late game. We'll give them their best general and a main line of 9 Western Auxilia Palatina, the second best spearmen they have and very deadly anti-cavalry troops. Two units of Herculiani Senores, who are not only almost twice the price of our horsemen, but also provide a morale boost to nearby troops, helping to keep the army together even after the general dies. 
Two units of Ravenna Elite Ballistiari, the most expensive crossbowmen in the game. They're still not a match for us in melee, but the heavy armor means we can't take them out that quickly. Four units of Scolae Palatine, who are not only the best melee cavalry unit the Romans have, but are also anti-cavalry specialists themselves armed with spears. Finally, two large Onigas. All remaining funds go to putting all of the Herculeani Senoras and cavalry up to max veterancy, the crossbows get one rank short of max, and the general gets a single rank. Total cost, 14,980. AI difficulty is, of course, the highest possible, and the terrain is a flat desert. Once again, I'll provide commentary so you don't just know what I'm doing, but why. Let's do it. So, this time we have twice as many troops, but the strategy remains largely the same. Attack with the flanks, kill their cavalry, and either circle around to the archers or punch through the center if the opportunity presents itself. If I was fighting the same opponent as last time, I'd be using my extra numbers to get started on their infantry right now. But, since my opponent's a lot deadlier, I'm instead hitting the flanks even harder than before. More troops on the flanks means the enemy cavalry dies faster, which means the infantry has a smaller window to catch us in melee. Those onagers in the back line are a huge threat and need to be engaged as soon as possible, but fortunately a gap is opened up and I can just charge right up the center. You may notice at this point that the flanks are a lot messier than last time, and that's partly because the enemy cavalry here is a lot more elite and takes longer to kill, but also because they have a lot of supporting infantry very close by, and there's no way I can engage their cavalry without also getting engaged by them. Still, it's better that we take heavy losses now to get those cavalry killed than to leave them alive and have them tip the balance in a critical fight later. On the right flank, it's business as usual. The cavalry dies, so we immediately run away and regroup. On the left, we've managed to engage a pretty manageable amount of infantry, so instead I decide to seize the opportunity and kill them. The battle in the back line is a bit more of a mess this time, thanks to those large onigas, but we're only a minute and a half in and I've killed or engaged all of their ranged units and cavalry, so it's good enough for me. At this point, the battle is becoming something of an unstructured mess, but I'll try and explain what my thought process at the time was. For each unit of infantry I want to kill, I need a lot of units and a lot of time alone, and if I lose either of those, then I'll lose the fight. Accordingly, most of my cavalry is committed to bullying their spearmen in those very one-sided battles on the periphery, while the rest is there just to hold the bulk of their army in place in the center and stop them from interfering. Of course, this is also a rather close and fast-paced battle, and I don't have a pause during fights, so I'm also just kind of guessing a bit and sending troops where my instincts tell me to. Enemy units have returned to the battle! The cavalry up on the right flank are currently standing around doing nothing, but this is actually really useful to my overall strategy. Because I have 20 units, and they only have a bit more than half that, using 3 cavalry as bait for 2 spearmen is a good trade, because I've wasted a greater proportion of their assets than mine. On top of that, I've drawn their infantry out into a vulnerable position to be engaged later, and if I need more reinforcements anywhere, my cavalry can get back to the fight much quicker than their spears can. The only downside is that if I forget to give new orders to those units, they'll be engaged and die, so I typically don't like to have more than one of these situations going on at once in a fight, since there's only so much I can focus on. I've committed those cavalry to the Onager fight now, knowing full well that the enemy spears can come back and flank me, so what I'm gambling on is that I'll have other troops free to attack them in the rear before my cavalry breaks. Despite desperately needing reinforcements in the Onager fight, I send some of my horsemen over to the other fight that I'm already winning, because once that's over I'll have a lot more cavalry free to act. Our men have regrouped. All other fights on the field are won, so almost all units are getting sent into the brawl in the center. The men have thrown down their weapons and are fleeing! 
Unlike the last battle, the remaining infantry won't break until they take significant losses, but I'm confident I'll win, so I start committing some troops to the cleanup. And there you have it. In campaign, I'd expect to lose no more than a couple of units, if any, from that, and the enemy army would likely be completely destroyed. Congratulations! If you've made it this far, you're now fully certified to run an Allen's campaign of your own. As I said at the start of the video, this is my first time making a tutorial like this, so if you have any feedback you'd like to leave, then I'd really appreciate it. I get way too many comments these days to reply to all but a tiny handful of them, but I do still read most of them. That's the end of the video, but I do also have a channel update if you're interested to know what I'm working on next. Alright, first of all, fuck me this took so much longer to make than I thought it would. I'm really sorry everybody, I made that two weeks prediction after I'd done just like some of the original preliminary work that was some of the easiest and quickest things to knock over and I just assumed the rest of the project was going to flow that fast and then it really, really didn't, as you can obviously tell. I don't want to rule out ever doing voice content like this again. In particular I wouldn't mind doing a West Rome strategy guide at some point once I've actually finished that campaign. But for the time being I'm not going to touch it again for a while, and if I ever do decide to do it again then it'll be as a side project while I'm still working on regular uploads in the meantime. Speaking of regular uploads, the next video should take much much less time to finish hopefully. Uh, it's not going to be a Total War one but I think you guys will still like it anyway. And there'll probably be at least another couple of uploads before West Rome Part 4. I know a lot of people are really keen for it and it has been a really long time, but there's a really good chance that Part 4 is going to be the finale, and if it is I really want to give it all the time it needs to be as good as it can possibly be. In other news, I have a Patreon now. If you like what I do and want to support the channel, well first of all you're doing that just by watching these videos already, so thank you, but if you'd like to support it a bit more directly, you can now pledge a recurring donation on Patreon and every time I upload a new video, I'll get paid that. Money from Patreon will mainly go towards my living expenses, but if I start earning enough then it can also help to improve the quality of videos, by allowing me to buy things like music rights to a song I'd particularly like to use, or getting more props for videos like Rartok. Obviously these videos already take me a really long time to make, so I'm not about to start making a whole lot of new things exclusive for Patreon because I just never get anything done, but patrons will still get access to a few exclusive little things. Every two weeks I'll post an update about what I'm working on, how close it is to being finished, what the next project's going to be, that kind of thing, and I'll also throw in a few things here and there for my patrons like sneak peeks of upcoming videos, or deleted scenes that didn't end up making it into an upload. Also because my upload schedule's a bit inconsistent, I'll only be charging patrons on a per upload basis rather than a per month one. Anything you can afford to pledge will really help me out, but obviously these are financially difficult times for a lot of people, so please only become a patron if it's something you can comfortably afford. Once again, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.